Hello, I'm Tony Geider. This is My New York. Our subject today is America's original art form. We call it jazz, but the musicians who first played it in the honky-tonks of New Orleans didn't. They called it ragtime. One of those musicians, Louis Armstrong, famously said, if you have to ask what jazz is, you'll never know. Now comes Dangerous Rhythms, a lively history of the relationship between jazz and organized crime through much of the 20th century. Author T.J. English is our guide, next. T.J. English, it's, a, it's good to welcome you to the program. Our paths have crossed before, but never this uh, yeah, intimately. Yeah, it's great, it's great to be here to see you. Uh, we met once before, 32 yeah, no. years ago, <laughs> on Live at Five. I'm not that old. I, uh, the very first book I published, The Westies, oh, yeah. had just come out, and I was on that show. I was interviewed by John Miller, but you were the co-anchor. You were the co-anchor of the, co -anchor, the, co of the show. Uh, and it was a great experience for me because Pete Hamill was also on the show, so I got to hang you know, out with him. Well, we should we room. should go back and get a tape of that thing and play that and just sit down and enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> let's talk about that. Dangerous Rhythms. Yes. What a book! Um, on the first page, you say jazz in its origins was a response to the horror and reality of lynching in America. I'm skeptical about that statement, T.J. T what do you mean? Well, I came to that uh, realization um, when I first sat down to write this book, and I had to um, grapple with the nature of, it, of the relationship between the musicians and the underworld figures. So why would jazz musicians be so willing to partner with hoodlums and gangsters in the criminal underworld? Um, wouldn't there be fear? Wouldn't they be afraid of violence? Uh, and so I thought that through, and um, it dawned on me that African Americans of that era, we're talking about the earliest years of the 20th century, yeah. had been dealing with the threat of violence and terror in their lives for generations. This was it's, not of course, new yeah. because of the lynching and just because of racism, <clears throat> the way they were treated in the streets by the average white cracker or policeman. I, I think I, I say in the book that the jazz musician of that era had less to fear from a mafiosi than they did from a white cracker in the street or a policeman. Yeah, you say it often and, and you, in terms of, for instance, Louis Armstrong. His theory was if, the, if, if I'm going to be in an arena that is controlled to a large degree by gangsters, then I'm going to get me the biggest gangster. Uh, there yeah. he is, uh, as my protection. But the other thing, I want to I finish on that because it's such a great question. The other thing was, I was pondering the nature of the invention of jazz. Where did jazz come from? Um, I don't think we fully appreciate today how revolutionary that music was when it came on the scene. Some people say it was an attempt to create a new musical language, but I think it was even more than that. It was an attempt to reorder the universe to obliterate the world as we know it and create a new way of expressing a joy of life. Stanley Crouch, the jazz writer Stanley Crouch said, nothing says I want to live as much as jazz. Yeah, and I, so then I started to think jazz came out of something traumatic. Uh, no, no question. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, the, it, you, it's the music of the people who were picking cotton and, you know, as slaves and singing songs to amuse themselves, to bring some joy into their lives, and in a way to keep alive the traditions, their African heritage traditions. But, you know, so, it, so the music goes way, way back. It, I mean, nobody called it jazz back then. But I see where you're going. I just thought, it, 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 when I read that, I just thought it, it seemed structured. Jazz isn't structured, it's improv, improv, it's spontaneous. But you see that connection. I see it. Um, I'm, I mean, I make my case for it. Um, it's a theory that I have. I think it explains things about the music, all the things you just said, but also the kind of uh, jazz. Uh, one of the things that characterized jazz when it came on the scene, and it scared a lot of 
white people was the aggressiveness of the music, yeah. the aggressive syncopation. I think it was a response very specifically to violence. You point out jazz and organized crime sort of came, sort of were gro uh, born, if you will, at the same time. Yeah. And, and they and seemed destined to, to complement each other. And that is a quirk of, of history. It has to do with uh, immigration patterns at the time. Um, in New Orleans, there was a wave of uh, Sicilian immigrants that started to come to New Orleans in the late 19th century and early into the 20th century. And the Sicilian immigrants become kind of crucial in the origins of the business of jazz. Um, that's a point I need to make. This book is about, this book is not so much about the music of jazz. It's about the business of jazz yeah. and the culture of jazz. And the Sicilians were some of the earliest uh, owners of clubs, jazz clubs in New Orleans. And this became a relationship and a pattern that continued all around the United States. You could go to St. Louis, you could go to Chicago, you could come to New York, you could go anywhere, and you would find this dynamic. Wasn't, uh, you talk about in, uh, Sicilians being uh, uh, fundamental in the organization uh, of the business. Yeah. Uh, wasn't N Nick LaRocca a, a Sicilian and he was part of the first, what was it called, the original Dixieland Jazz? Sure, band. yes, well he's a good example. Uh, Nick LaRocca was a Sicilian grew up in a neighborhood in, in New Orleans called Irish Channel. Um, he was a musician. He f formulated this band, which was, we, we, we sort of note as the first band that was ever recorded. It wasn't really the first, but it was the first to have a commercial record that was a big hit record. Um, he's a controversial figure because later in life, he became kind of a forgotten man and he resented the fact that jazz was now seen as African-American music. And he made, mm. some, he made some racist statements in interviews and radio saying, jazz was not started by blacks, it was started by whites. It's white music. Well, yeah, and the original, you point out in the book that the original Dixieland Jazz Band was, it was a sort of a construct of Victor Records who was looking to record this music and wanted white people to fear record it. The original yeah. band, that original Dixieland, was all white guys. The fear was that white uh, consumers wouldn't buy music from black musicians. This was, you know, pre-Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong and others uh, changed all of that dramatically when they came on the scene, but that was the thinking. Talk a little about Louis and this, this kid from Bacco, Bacco Town. Yeah. This book was such a joy because I got to go back and commune with these characters, the spirit mm. of Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and Louis Prima and all these characters uh, come alive in your imagination when you're writing the book. And now in this day and age with streaming of music, I can also listen to that music while I'm writing it. Oh, so you can yeah. really sort of take yourself into the, the inner sanctum of the spirit of Louis Armstrong. And the spirit of Louis Armstrong is is for all time. Um, you know, Armstrong was not just a phenomenal, uh, once in a lifetime type of musician and entertainer and singer, but he was such a joyous performer. He came to define almost everything we think about jazz mm -hmm. just in his being and who he was and his ability to cross racial boundaries. What um, to talk a little bit about, about this little kid at seven is already a, a pretty prodigious cornet player, yeah. and is and is realizing, boy, I can, you know, I can play, and these clubs are, are going to be the place where I'm, I'm going to. Well, he worshipped King Oliver, yeah, and he he and, and Buddy Bolden, oh, and he and he wound place. up in the street as a young kid, and he was picking up this music from the street. He wound up in a boy's home for firing a gun in the air on on New Year's Eve, and which was against the law, and he got thrown into a boy's home. And it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to him because that's where he had his first music instructor and he really started to learn how to play the instrument. By the time he came out of that boy's home, he was a, f a force of nature, unlike anything that had been seen before. The interesting thing is, in terms of this book, he had to learn to navigate the underworld because the clubs were in the underworld. The clubs were in the bad side of town. The clubs were owned and run by gangsters. Storyville. Yes, Storyville, even, even a subset of that called Black Storyville, which were the clubs where the blacks could patronize. Um, so he had to navigate this world, and he writes about it in a memoir that he published about 
Growing Up in New Orleans, it's a beautiful memoir. Everyone cites it. It's, it's loaded with flavor. And he, deals, he writes a lot about the criminal world. And very early on, he was enamored with the, with the disreputable characters. He was enamored with that side of life. He, he hung around them. He liked to hang around them. He admired certain things about them. I think this was just the admiration of a young boy who had grown up in the streets and had the kind of fear. He wasn't a tough guy himself. He had a kind of fear, and so he admired the tough guys that had no fear. Yeah. That was uh, something that attracted him. And he chose a manager early on. He leaves New Orleans and he goes to Chicago. That's where his career really takes off. And from the very beginning, he has this manager named Joe Glazer, who was a club owner and was kind of a low-level guy in the, uh, Al Capone's criminal organization. And he just loved Joe Glazer uh, from very early on, even though they were almost the same age, three years, uh, Glazer was three years older. He called him Papa. He was a father figure to him. And, and Glazer became the, the biggest manager in the history of jazz based on the fact that he was Armstrong's manager, and he remained Armstrong's manager right up until the day he died. Many of the um, great jazz figures, you know, from Louis on Duke, uh, uh, who have written memoirs, deal with this subject in those memoirs. For instance, Duke writes about uh, what it was like to work, you know, to be yeah. the house band at the Cotton Club, yes. and and um, I guess we haven't really specifically touched on it. But what we've got musicians who are feeling um, this is where they belong and, and it's best for their careers with these underworld figures, but, they, but there was an awful lot of racism uh, involved in, and you, you look just at the name of the Cotton Club, <laughs> you know, kind of says uh, yeah. racism. Plantation. Plantation Another mentality. Another popular club. Now they had a club that was called the Plantation. Yeah, there was a yeah. second one. What, can, you, can you recall some of what Duke says in his memoir about about having worked, on, you know, in that kind of a... Yeah, movie. you're right. Duke comments on it in his memoir, but he didn't talk about it much for a long time. None of them did, I don't uh, think. They kept their mouths shut. Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, uh, they were in the midst of that world. Um, they were employed by and fraternizing with big-name gangsters like Oni Madden and Al Capone and Legs Diamond and many others. And that was just the policy. Um, uh, Earl Hines, fa Earl Father Hines in Chicago said he had a philosophy and he called it the philosophy of the three monkeys. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. That's how he believed you survived in those clubs. You were employed by the gangsters and you just didn't see things and you kept your mouth, your mouth shut. Um, the guy who wrote most openly about it later in life was Cab Calloway. And he said it was a bit frightening because if you became popular at the, as a performer at the clubs like Duke Ellington did, they would assign you bodyguards everywhere you went. And um, Calloway said that made him more scared than anything to have these big hoods with the long coats on and the fedoras, white guys who went yeah. with him everywhere he went. So you learn to deal with it. They learned to deal with it. And they knew that's where the bread was buttered, and so they dealt with it. You mentioned Basie, uh, who, who really got his uh, career started in Kansas City, 18th and Vine, yeah. was the, if we can call it, the, the Storyville of Kansas yeah. City. You know, it, all the same there. Incredible district for music. Yeah, beautiful place. Well, what you find is, starting with Storyville, 18th and Vine, south side of Chicago, Harlem in New York, the Central Avenue Jazz District in Los Angeles, you start having these vice and music districts popping up all over the place. And they're all sort of uh, based along a, a similar template. The local hoods own the clubs. Um, and uh, the, so the gambling takes place in this area. And, and by gambling, I mean card games and numbers. Betting the number was a big source yeah. of revenue for the, for the mob. And the other thing that was great for the musicians is the clubs, by and large, were a front for the criminals to launder their illegal proceeds. So the clubs, it wasn't required that the clubs make a lot of money. 
That's not why they existed. They existed as a front. So that was great. That's part of the reason there was this era of jazz because jazz has never been at the club level, particularly economically viable thing. Yeah. Um, but it was then because they didn't have to worry about the clubs generating revenue. Prohibition. I think there's a misperception that, a misconception that without prohibition, jazz might have, uh, might have not reached the heights that it did. Uh, I don't know. You can debate that. I think the, the horse was out of the barn by then. Jazz was hugely popular yeah. even before prohibition began. And I think what prohibition did was quantify or, or basically a, a business model. Again, going back to this uh, fact that this book is mostly about the business of jazz, uh, it was hugely important as a business model. Um, in every speakeasy in town, there would be a, a small combo playing. Uh, it was just sort of de rigueur. It was what was expected in, in any speakeasy you went into. And then you'd have the bigger clubs like the Cotton Club and others where you'd have big orchestras. Uh, and this was magnificent. Jazz had not really seen this before. An economic model that made it possible to hire and have uh, a house band that, it, that included like 25 to 30 musicians. Um, this kind of was incredible in terms of the development of the music, um, especially in the hands of somebody like Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington at the Cotton Club in the late 20s created a version of jazz, and you can still hear it. It's still, you listen to it now, and it's as fresh as it ever was. Uh, songs like Black and Tan Fantasy right. and The Mooch and Creole Love Song. are songs that were way above anything that was being composed and recorded up to that period well, of time. Well, he was in a sort of writing his own symphony. Yeah, he was, he was, the, the, the ironic thing is he was interpreting it almost as classical music, but he was doing it in the underworld, in these clubs that were owned by gangsters, where people came to drink uh, booze, which was illegal, an illegal substance. And I think uh, Duke was, very aware of all of this, and he incorporated all of it into the music. I say in the book that he wrote music for the underworld, the music of the underworld. He was capturing the mood of that reality in real yeah. time as it was happening. Again, talking about the business, I was, I was, I don't know if I should say startled, but um, uh, it certainly <laughs> opened my eyes to uh, uh, Birdland. I remember getting thrown out of Birdland when I was, <laughs> before I was legal, trying to get in to listen to whoever it was, and I had a fake ID, and they were, and I lasted in there about two minutes, and they uh. threw me out. But, you know, I'm reading about Birdland in this book, and uh, it, it was, the, the corruption was just incredible, and what was going on as a business, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, Birdland, I, Birdland, I love the dichotomy of Birdland, because Birdland was, owned and operated by a guy named Morris Levy, Mo yeah. Levy, who was a bit of a hoodlum and a gangster himself. Uh, he admired those kind of guys. And from the very beginning when he got into the club business in New York and in Miami, mostly in New York, um, he, he, he was one of these guys who understood right away, look, the, the mob runs this operation, and so what we're going to do is construct an operation that facilitates the needs of the mob better than any club that's been run before, and that's going to facilitate our needs. And our needs were to, put, to showcase the greatest jazz musicians living at that time, in the 40s and the 50s. Mo Levy was a, may have been a hoodlum, but he was also a visionary and very progressive in terms of jazz. Um, Birdland was at its height during the period of bebop. Bebop was really interesting, complicated music, you know? It separated the men from the boys in a way. Yeah. Uh, it was challenging and complex, and it wasn't as commercial as swing music had been, for instance. Um, and um, rather than run away from it, Mo Levy, rather than think that it's not commercial and run away from it, he showcased it because it was cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And he recognized that jazz fans, true jazz fans, what they want is authenticity. 
They don't want watered down jazz. You cannot make jazz popular by watering it down. Right. You can only make jazz popular with the diehard jazz aficionados by making it as true uh, to the principles of jazz uh, as you can. And I think Levy understood that. And he, he also had a record label, Reprise, uh, sorry, uh, Roulette, Roulette Records. Yeah. Reprise was Frank Sinatra's label. Roulette Records, uh, where he recorded them. He ripped them all off. He had a yeah. saying, he said, you want royalties, go to England. <laughs> you know, he was that kind of guy. He ripped them off and they knew he was ripping them off, but they still saw it as an opportunity. Uh, we haven't mentioned Sinatra in Vegas, but I don't know that we have to. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Willie Moretti, who was... No, but his... it was fun. Let me say, sorry to interrupt, but it, was, it was fun to put Frank Sinatra in context. Because everyone thinks they know about Frank Sinatra and the mob. It's been written about a lot. There's been a lot of things said about it. I think what this book does, starting with the Sicilians in New Orleans and the early years of the 20th century, you see the types of relationships that Frank Sinatra inherited in Hoboken, New Jersey, which were the same types of relationships that were begun in New Orleans in 1910. And so Frank didn't create this relationship. He inherited these relationships, and, and all the Italian-American well, singers had to deal with it to one degree or well, another. Well, I think in, you point out uh, this gangster, Willie Moretti, was like... Uh, he godfather. Was, uh, his godfather. His yeah. godfather. Yeah. And Literally. he lived around the corner from yeah. him. Yeah. And, and Moretti got whacked. He got murdered in 51 for having testified at the, uh, at the Kefauver, Kefauver hearings, yeah. and they, they didn't like some of the things he said, and he got killed. And this was 51. Frank was still a relatively young man. There were a few points along the way of Frank Sinatra's career where his closest contact in the mafia got whacked. Frank did not take that as an opportunity to walk away from the mafia. He always doubled down and found a new guy. After Willie Moretti, it was Sam Giancana. There was always somebody that he was going to form a relationship with like that. I want to come back to this this uh, point you were making about uh, Ellington's music and uh, how he was elevating. And I, there was an interesting quote from Nina Simone, who who's, that wasn't her actual name. She took that name because she she uh, played and sang jazz, and her family didn't want that. But um, a great songwriter, civil rights activist, and she said, "Jazz is a white term." to define black people. My music is black classical music. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, I've had this conversation with a lot of musicians over the years. Um, they don't like the term jazz, um, many of them. When you think it through, they begin to see it as sort of a limiting term. Um, you know, jazz is, again, talking about the business of jazz. Jazz is a marketing term, let's face it. It was created to sell the music. So the term jazz, I think, initially was, um, I'm not even sure it was a musical term. I think it was a term about uh, the expressiveness of and playing jazz, listening to jazz, partaking of that spirit, the spirit of jazz. Yeah, I've read that it was originally re uh, uh, used in, I think, the West Coast and referring to sports enthusiasm. Right. It was somehow, somehow they came up with yeah, that. Yeah, and then it became a marketing term. A lot of, a yeah. lot of musicians rent, uh, resent it. I'm a big aficionado of the Latin jazz, the, the Latin version of jazz. I don't even like to call it Latin jazz because that category separates it and categorizes it somewhere. To me, it's just jazz. It has all these characteristics that are Latin or African mostly by way of Latin America, by way of Cuba, specifically Afro-Cuban music and its influence on jazz. These are terms we all use when we write about the music, when we market the music. I don't think these terms have much meaning to the musicians themselves. There is so much more in, in TJ's book uh, that you need to read and, and learn. And one of the most touching moments in the book is uh, the story of Mary Lou Williams, great pianist who, who referred to the music business as the muck and the mud. Yeah. And essentially uh, triumphed, at, you know, and wrote a mass. At yeah, the end. yeah. Can you just can so you glad just you wrap that up real quick? Cause we're so glad you brought that up. She was a great piano player that came out of Pennsylvania, but 
found her calling in the 18th and Vine District in Kansas City. But she pops up in all the great jazz eras and clubs all the way throughout the 20th century. By the 1960s, she was disgusted with the business of the music um, for a lot of reasons. She was a woman in an all-male environment. Right. Um, she got preyed upon by uh, managers like Joe Glazer. She just got disgusted. She got disgusted with Birdland. She used to go straight from her gigs at Birdland to church because she felt she just had to get rid of the bad vibes of, from Birdland. And she quit. Somewhere in the 60s, she quit completely. And then in the 70s, she wanted to come back to the music. And she was like, how can I do this in a holistic way that is not going to drag me down into the muck and the mud of the business? And she started performing in churches. And she wrote a mass. She converted to Catholicism. And she wrote a mass. Well, I'm going to have to ask you to, to leave it there. It's, uh, maybe we'll call it a teaser because <laughs> we're, we're out of time, TJ. But... You need to pick up dangerous rhythms and, um, uh, and, and read about Mary Lou Williams, read about the business, read about how the business of jazz and the business of the mob declined uh, at the end of the 20th century. There's so much in that book, and I thank you for coming thank here. Thank you, Tony. It's been great. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.